Hosta, I'm from Knowledge Media Institute, the Open University in Milton Keynes, United Kingdom. And uh, I'll show you uh, how we uh, uh, do uh, predictions uh, or early identification of at-risk students if we don't have uh, the data from uh, the past. Uh, so some motivation in the beginning. Uh, putting some numbers, uh, according to various reports, uh, 80% of students uh, finishes, uh, finish the uh, high schools in time in the uh, United States. Uh, according to other report, uh, if we take this number for higher education, this number goes to 40%. If you take into account only distant education, then this number goes to 22%. Uh, and uh, in massive uh, open online courses, MOOCs, this number is even worse. So in 2013, it was 5%. Now we go a little bit up. Uh, the, the latest number that I have found was 25%. Um, so it is really crucial to, uh, to, to, to have the problem of like, improving the retention of students. Uh, on top of that, uh, uh, we computed at the Open University uh, 32 co for the 32 courses with uh, more than 1,000 students uh, that if we increase in these courses uh, the retention up to 10%, the costs would be like 7 million pounds. Uh, according to yesterday, it's roughly 9 million of United States dollars, American dollars. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the problem uh, uh, seems interesting. So this is an overview of the whole talk. So first of all, uh, it's important to know who are these at-risk students because the definition is not uh, clear or the same across uh, the published papers. Then I'll show you how uh, we uh, do the predictions using uh, legacy data at the Open University since uh, 2014. And uh, what are our options if we don't have this data? So uh, who, who, who is at-risk student? It might be the most simple definition, the student that will not finish uh, the course, so it will fail in the course. It might be also a student that will not be registered in the last week of the course. It might be a student that will uh, the register in the next week. If we take uh, only participation in the VLE, it might be a student that will not participate in the last week of the course, or a student that will not uh, uh, engage in the VLE the next week. So at the Open University, uh, the context is that uh, students start their courses, which are roughly 20 to 30 weeks uh, long. They start with some demographic background, uh, with some possibly previous results, and they s interact with the VLE uh, in uh, logical subsequent blocks, which are finished by assignments. I denote them as A1, A2, and uh, A3. And if they are uh, if they make it until the final exam and they are successful in the exam, they succeed in the course. I'll make a small turn here uh, because the, the numbers that I will report further comes from uh, the uh, Open University Learning Analytics dataset, which I highly recommend you to download. It's freely available either on uh, our website or in uh, Machine Learning Report of University of California, Irvine. This dataset has uh, seven courses in four presentations. Uh, they are fully anonymized, <laughs> and uh, they, are com they come from uh, years 2013 and 14. The B stands for courses that uh, starts in February J if they start in October. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, picture comes from uh, the paper of uh, Ormon Simpson from uh, 2005, and uh, it shows uh, how <coughs> students progress in the course in terms of submitting their assignments. So they start like 100% students start the course. Then uh, according to the study, 38% not submit the first uh, uh, assignment. Then uh, this number of students goes up to 62%, 57 and 52. If we take the data fr uh, from uh, just the level one courses, which is six, six courses from our data set, this number is uh, more optimistic. Uh, only 25% the student uh, uh, not submit the first uh, assignment, but then uh, more students not submit the, the further assignment. So it a little bit moves further, but anyway, even though 25% is a, a huge number, and uh, 
basically most of this uh, student group out in the beginning if they not submit an assessment. Uh, so why is it important? So if uh, we take this 25% not, student not submitting then the ATMA, and if we take a probability of uh, if the student not submit the TMA, in 96% they will fail the course. If they submit, there is still like 38% of chance that they will fail, but uh, significantly this uh, number is lower. So this is how we do it since uh, spring 2014 for 72 courses, approximately predicted uh, 120,000 students. Uh, we have a, a course AAA in 2014J. We are at some prediction date and we are predicting if the student will or will not submit the TMA because that was identified. That is the key, uh, one of the key factors for early uh, pre uh, identification. Uh, to learn the model, we use the previous presentation of the same type. So if we have presentation that started in October, we use the previous years that started again in October. We learn the machine learning model and we predict in the current uh, presentation of the, of the course. Then we, we move beyond the cutoff date and we evaluate the model. <coughs> uh, but now, what if we don't have this uh, previous presentation? Uh, so is there any way how we can identify or how we can predict these non-submissions from the data in the running course? It turns out that we have uh, active students in the beginning that uh, already submit their assignment before. So the idea is let's use their behavior, differentiate against the other that already haven't submit the TMA, and predict if they submit uh, within the cutoff date. Right, so we called uh, this model Ouroboros. It's a mythical snake that is eating its own tail. So basically we are using the student that already submitted to feedback the model. Uh, so the framework is the same, just we don't have the uh, previous presentation. Again, we learn the machine learning model at some uh, day in time. We, we provide the predictions. Uh, just to formulate the task somehow. Uh, so given uh, some days to the cutoff week, cutoff date, sorry, uh, we predict if the student will or will not submit the assignment within the cutoff date. Uh, we we, uh, we, we don't imp improve our predictions by predicting already uh, born, uh, uh, sorry, gender of already born uh, uh, children. So we omit the uh, already submitted students in the evaluation and the, uh, the one that already registered from the course. Uh, so now how do we do that? So if we are, uh, now means the day when we predict, we are three days before the cutoff date. Uh, we, in order to train the model, uh, we move four days back because we have the data from yesterday and we predict if the student will submit the today or within the days in the cutoff date, right? So in the training data, we move by the length of the window until the cutoff date backwards. We create, we call it virtual now and virtual cutoff date. Virtual now, virtual cutoff date. We omit uh, the data for learning in, within this window. <coughs> and we only measure here if the student <coughs> submitted the assignment or not. And we use this data to predict it. Then, in the testing data, we take all, all the information up till the current prediction date and we make the predictions. So this, uh, this will cause that uh, this window, as we go in the time, will uh, widen up. Uh, so what features are, are available for us? So first we have some demographics and most importantly we have the interaction in the VLE. Daily counts, daily counts group by the activity types, so like uh, interaction in the forum with video. Out of them we uh, create some summary statistics like first, the first login, uh, last login, number of consecutive days in the VLE and so on and further uh, uh, registration date of the student in the course. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we evaluate this on four level one courses in uh, the 2014J on the Open University Learning Analytics data set. Uh, only four because we took only level one, one courses. 
and we omitted uh, one of the courses that uh, doesn't have a previous presentation because we also want to uh, demonstrate the comparison against if we train the models um, using the previous presentation, right? So these courses have uh, various uh, fields. Uh, they are quite uh, long, uh, uh, more than 1,000 students in all of them, uh, with pass rate uh, around 50%, and the submission rate is uh, 77 to 78%. So it is a bit higher than for the whole data set, because it, it was a bit lower in the 2013 J presentation. Uh, we evaluated for, for uh, for a, we, we did a daily prediction, so we went like for the day of cut uh, cut off date and 11 days in uh, going back into the past. Uh, we use for this uh, seven various machine learning algorithms, and uh, basically we set up two very simple baseline models. The, the first one is really stupid, so let's say uh, we consider that every student will not submit, and the second one let's predict only the students that haven't logged into the VLE so far that will not submit the TMA. And second, we compared this uh, with uh, uh, training using the previous presentation. What you will see will be uh, the number that is uh, mean value across all the courses. So which evaluation metric? Uh, we used the uh, area under the precision and recall curve. You might ask why, because you don't see this often in the publications. So precision, uh, area under the precision recall curve is uh, uh, area under the curve that is created by uh, moving the threshold across the probabilistic classifiers, and you report various numbers of recall and precision on the right side. Then you take this, the area under this curve, and you have the evaluation metric. So why this one uh, uh, opposed to more used uh, receiver operation characteristic? Uh, because um, for our problem, we basically um, don't need to capture the fact uh, about correct predictions for students that submit. We are more interested, uh, or for us, the classifier is better if it performs good on the non-submission uh, non -submission class, and this is what is captured in the precision and recall. Uh, moreover, the problem is a bit complicated because uh, as the number of students that submit uh, is low, <coughs> quite to, uh, opposed to the student that uh, not submit, uh, we encounter the problem of imbalanced data. So the classes are not balanced. Mm -hmm. And this caused several problems in the machine learning uh, uh, area. Uh, and there are a couple of uh, things that you can do. I will not go deep, but basically what you can do is uh, you penalize the uh, classification uh, error on the minority class, or you can sample the data in a way that they become more balanced or some algorithms even uh, have these uh, mechanisms built in their, in their uh, design. So, uh, and we use this uh, information to select our machine learning algorithms. So this is the evaluation for zero is the cutoff date and up to 11 days before the cutoff. Uh, what we can see that if we go closer to the cutoff, the predictions improve drastically, especially in the day of cutoff. This is because a, uh, the, the imbalance ratio decreases, and B, we have more information about the student. Uh, for the imbalance problem, it's interesting that uh, if you use this penalizing uh, uh, of errors for minority class for training for logistic regression, or for SBM. So you move then from uh, error, uh, sorry, for the performance metric for logistic relation here to, uh, to the blue one here. So you see that this improves the prediction. What is uh, most important is that uh, by far uh, random forest classifier uh, was the best one. Uh, so, but can we still improve even this random forest? Uh, it turns out that yes, not for uh, not drastically for all the days, but uh, if we use some sampling techniques, we can go even a bit, uh, bit up. Uh, if we compare this to learning with previous presentation, uh, we don't face this problem of imbalanced data, so the predictions are much more stable and uh, even a bit higher. 
so, but once we go closer to the cutoff date, uh, the predictions are even a bit uh, better because uh, basically the predictions or the model uh, that is learning on the course uh, that is running probably have more information about the current design of the course. This is fine. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. That's because uh, there is a fee liability point for some courses. So basically, in these days, there, are, there is a number of students that are registered. So basically, imagine that this low hanging fruit now disappears from the data. If we include this student in the prediction, it will only go up. So now, how can we use this uh, for recommendation in terms of interventions? Uh, so first, we can use the, the model as it is, uh, and uh, following the prediction, they usually report at-risk students for the probabilities that are higher than 0 0.5. This is threshold-based uh, classification prediction. Uh, or uh, there might be a situation that, uh, for example, the university has like only uh, I don't know, resources for making 20% of the or 10% of the student to intervene. So then this classifier works a bit different. Uh, le uh, we can select only 10% or 20% of these students to intervene, or let's le like take them as uh, they are at risk. So what it uh, does uh, for our evaluation. This is uh, uh, precision and recall for uh, if we take a top 10% or top 25% uh, of students that are at risk. So precision basically says if you identify the student as at risk, how many of them are really at risk and recall how many of those that are really at risk did you identify or have you identified. So uh, if you select lower number of students, they, they are more precise, so it means that uh, the students on the top of your list are really like, your predictions are better for them, but you are, uh, uh, you are missing, missing some of them. So if you go to 25%, then the recall increases, but precision goes down. Now, okay, that's nice. So that's, that can give you some number of, okay, if I have like 10% of uh, resources for making the, the interventions, how, how, how will I get, but are there any recommendation, recommendations? Uh, uh, so for this, you can use uh, F measure, which is basically harmonic mean of precision and recall. And if you point, uh, point this uh, uh, evaluation across the days and, uh, for, and for different uh, uh, number of K, uh, you will see that the, the highest number is if you select the uh, top 25% uh, uh, of students as at risk. Uh, the, the original classifier which, uh, which uh, classifies based on like more than 50% uh, is a little bit lower. So my recommendation would be uh, use the one that uh, takes your 25 or one quarter of your student as at risk. So to give some conclusions, uh, we created or designed this model that can identify student uh, without the legacy data. It has a predictive power. Uh, it fair performs these baseline models. Once it gets closer, it's even better than uh, the, the training using the legacy data. Uh, if you found, find a similar condition in any other context, like there is some deadline specified and there are students that are fulfilling this deadline in advance, you can use it somewhere else. Uh, but uh, with this study, there is a limitation that uh, you cannot make really conclusions uh, that uh, maybe uh, some... Uh, uh, some uh, evaluation was because of the design of the course, maybe. So uh, right now we are working on generalizing this framework and uh, putting results on more courses. It will not be in a way uh, as a reproducible research, but uh, maybe the, the results might be, might be even more interesting. And uh, we, we want to compare this approach in the later uh, phases of the course for later assignments and, uh, and uh, most of all, uh, we, we also want to improve the predictions that will combine both the data from uh, legacy uh, data and the current uh, model. So uh, that's uh, really all, and thank you for your attention.
and I also included uh, links to the work that is uh, related to, to, to this work that we present on Mac. Thank you. This is just the first assessment of the curse, of course. So, uh, I guess I'd maybe you'll like explain just a little bit more mm -hmm. about so as you go to that first assessment um, and you're training on those who have turned in the assignment already, you're taking those individuals then out of the pool. Wouldn't it then be easier to predict because the frequency of people that didn't turn in become less, like there's more of them relative to the total? Yep. How do you sort of normalize for the fact that you're sort of taking out a chunk of individuals? And so, at, so if you graph that, the prediction problem isn't the same problem, right? So mm -hmm. because you've taken some out. So how do you really understand that as a sort of like a fair comparison as the point? Yeah, but basically the the class of non-submissions doesn't change really. It's the same. It's, I mean. You have students that submit, right. but these disappear from your testing data, not the ones that do, not, don't submit. Right. They are still there. Right. And they don't submit until the cutoff date. Right, but you're, when, if you were then sort of graphing your, your success rate of prediction, mm -hmm. of course your success rate of prediction is going to increase even if you didn't learn anything. I, of, I, I'm not suggesting that you're not learning anything, but the, base, the baseline of that should be getting better because you're removing individuals actually not if you actually it's going down because if you submit everyone that is uh, that will not submit uh, okay it's not it, it, it's a bit, a bit complicated because there are also students that they register so there are like examples from both classes that disappear so that's why we did this baseline model to, to exactly capture this situation so yeah it will improve but it will not improve as much so can, was there any way to just like partition out how much of the getting better is due to just the removal of one class versus the learning? Because there should be two things that would cause the model to get better. Mm -hmm. so is there a way, because, and what we're really after is like, you know, the model learned. And we want to know, so, you know, the trend line should be like this. We want to partition now how much of that is mm -hmm. baseline and how much of that is to learn. Yeah, I don't remember the exact number, but but uh, when I started writing this evaluation, I, I had this, like removing this uh, this data or this approach, and this was much more easier to explain to others. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Your data comes from MOOCs, yes? And uh, no, oh. it's okay. uh, the distance-based uh, university, so it's higher education. Uh, open university yes. Course. Yes. got a question about interventions and how that might change things, right? So this was nice in that um, you were able to, so the cold start problem is huge, right? And, and especially if you have some new class that you're uh, starting up and you want to be able to have predictive models. Um, but what happens when we, you want to be able to use this data for interventions and then you've got another completionary factor in your, in your model, right? Which is whatever the instructor did and to whomever they did it. Um, have you thought about how you might handle that in future iterations? Yeah, we are thinking about this for the last two years. Mm -hmm. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, we can discuss it later, but uh, it's, uh, usually this is a problem of uh, like uh, the storage of the data at the university. So... Uh, oh, just tracking uh, the Yes, but, yeah, but can you track, for example, uh, there are two points of contact at the Open University, right? At least two. So if this is, uh, there is a tutor that will have like 20 students. And then there is a student support team. So there is a tracking of the contacts of this student support team. But can you? Do you really want to track what the tutor did to the student? Like, 
he, he can pick his phone and call him. That's a bit difficult. So we, and this is what uh, they will present hopefully to, tomorrow. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, we, we implemented some uh, stuff in our dashboard that tutors are, we, uh, we, we encourage them to fill this in that they, uh, they, they make this uh, intervention, but uh, it's, uh, it's about in this phase of convincing other people that it's useful and so that we can feed back to the model. Any other questions? All right, I'll take the speaker. Thank you.